each one of us. It was culminated last year, December 12, 2017, with Dr. Michael Joseph Dino as the resource speaker with the topic, Launching the Best Practices in AUP Graduate School. And today, we are going to have Establishing Research Gap in Evidence-Based Studies. To finally embark on our research journey, may we call on Dr. Jolly S. Palila to give us opening remarks, which will be followed by introduction of the speaker to be also given by her. Good morning. Welcome to the next part of our program, which is the Research Enhancement Seminar. This is actually the continuation of our launching the best practices in AUP graduate school research. Uh, we have a theme before, integrating research in graduate classes. But this is not actually limited to our graduate school teachers. We are inviting all teachers who are willing to learn because we are required actually to do research if you are in the teaching uh, profession. Now, in our program, if you have a copy of this program, we provided uh, the topics and the schedule for your reference, but actually it was presented a while ago by Dr. Narbarte. And um, I hope and I'm sure you will be learning a lot from this series of seminars. And I'm looking forward toward uh, our enjoy enjoyable experience or research experience in this university. Now, before I sit down, I'm going to introduce to you our speaker this morning. She is a, an English teacher, methodologist, panelist, advisor in thesis and dissertation. She published research papers in refereed journals. She finished her PhD in Linguistic in University Utara, Malaysia. And currently, she is our editor and research consultant of 11 degree programs here at AUP. Now let us welcome Dr. Eunice Aklan and give her our undivided attention. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. All right. Our VPA mentioned about why do we need to update ourselves, especially in terms of research. So we at the University Research Center have to up update you also with the trends in the international research world. Why do we need to update? First of all, okay, um, we have to know that the criteria for the World University Ranking, which is uh, now um, the common goal of many universities around the world, has research as the second very common um, criterion. The first one, of course, is teaching, and the second is research. And if you see the research criterion, it involves the volume, income, and reputation according to the higher education university ranking. And for QS, World University Ranking, that criterion includes citation, not only volume, but citation. And the issue here now is how a research will be cited if we publish. Because now, uh, the mantra before was publish or perish, but now it's publish and get cited. Now, uh, we have to go away from just uh, 
uh, storing our research journals in the shelves, but we have to publish them for them to be searchable by researchers or scholars around the world. And we will be cited. When, when we will be cited, of course, it means that we have a contribution to the body of knowledge. Now, uh, we have to assess where we are. Uh, are we publishing for not to perish so that we will not perish? Or are we publishing to get cited? Because uh, if you, you will see here, citation is one of the very important criteria for university world ranking. And um, it has always been said that the Philippines has been lagging behind in terms of research, and it's true. So we need to update ourselves with, with what the international research um, is doing. So for example, I'll just give you a quick view about where we are now. Yeah, uh, Where the Philippines is now. No, it's too small. It's rather small. Um, yeah. The Philippines, in terms of the Philippines, only the University of the Philippines has entered into the world university ranking. And so we need to really update ourselves as to how we can be, not really be counted in, but at least we will be updating ourselves in terms of research. Because if you will see, uh, in terms of ASEAN, the ASEAN block, um, Singapore is still leading, of course, in terms of research. And uh, second uh, is between Malaysia and Thailand. And where are we? Well, uh, we are now at the bottom. So we need to really wake up <laughs> in that aspect. Okay. Now going to the important uh, aspect of research, which is my topic today. Establishing research gap in evidence-based studies. We say evidence-based studies, which means if there is no research gap, which we're going to learn how we can establish it, will not be evidence-based, okay? Uh, first, let's define research. How do we define research? Research is the investigation or experimentation aimed at the discovery and interpretation of facts, revision of accepted theories or laws in the light of new facts, or practical application of such new or revised theories or laws, according to Miriam uh, Webster. So new, new facts, we need to develop new facts. It is actually our, um, our responsibility. It's one of our duties as a university to, um, to produce new knowledge, to, uh, to research to produce new knowledge. Um, according to Oxford, it is the systematic investigation and study of materials and sources in order to establish facts and reach new conclusions. So conclusion is a very important part of the research. So we will see later what uh, we, will, we need to see in the conclusion as well in relation to uh, building new knowledge. So what is research gap then? It is a topic. It is a topic or area for which missing or insufficient information limits the ability to reach a conclusion for a question. So if we have not established a research gap, we will not know that uh, uh, where we have to situate our study. Another important definition or uh, giving the form of format is by Cooley and Lukowicz, which I'm using in my scientific writing class. This is a very important uh, book that I have gifted to me by my supervisor in Malaysia. And this book starts with the first chapter on identifying the research gap. So 
uh, that shows the importance of this topic to all of us. We can't do any research without identifying the research gap. Research gap may be in the form of a newly discovered problem or an incomplete answer to a previously researched, prob researched problem, or if a phenomenon has not been investigated in a particular place setting or setting with a particular group of people or from a particular perspective. Okay, from this definition, what are the research gaps then that you can uh, possibly identify in your literature review? Of course, the basis for the research gap is doing a systematic literature review. Okay, Mamimi, what are the possible research gaps that you can identify with uh, the definition of uh, Cooley and Lukowicz. Can you identify three possible gaps? Okay, uh, specific theory, uh, particular population or people, and or group, and yeah, perspective, right? The theory, all right. Yeah, okay, we will learn the systematic way of identifying the research gap in a while. Okay, so as what I said earlier, research gap is the basis for knowledge contribution. So you need to really identify it in the first place before you do your proposal defense or you cannot be published unless you have it because it is the first thing that the reviewers will look for. Reviewers will just reject. Okay, I'm talking about reputable publications, not the, that's why uh, I don't <laughs> encourage uh, facult the faculty or the, my students to uh, just uh, publish in any publication or, or journal because you may just pay the publication with a lot of money without you getting the benefits of uh, being reviewed. And that is actually where we researchers, we learn a lot from, especially if it, uh, the, re uh, the reviewer, um, the set of reviewer includes someone who is uh, an expert in your field. That's why, of course, I do not claim expertise in med tech, for example, I can just see probably your method, but I cannot see the content. So that is the importance of peer review. Now, uh, going back to what I said, uh, this is the most important part or the first part that they need to see in your introduction. So upon just reading the first part or the first two or three paragraphs of your manuscript, they already see if you know oh, what the, uh, what is the most important basis for doing research, okay? So, um, you need to do first of all systematic literature review. So, because it is the standard for evaluating the current state of scientific knowledge regarding a specific topic, especially in the clinical area. Yeah, uh, I remember uh, when we, when when we and, and I had to um, apply for a grant, a uh, $125,000 grant uh, per year, so which means we should be getting like uh, $250,000 for, uh, for two years. But uh, we were not able to meet the deadline because first of all, we had to establish our study by looking for the research gaps. And that's uh, the basic thing that the, the funders wanted us to establish. So it's not only in the thesis or dissertations that we need this, but especially when we publish and also when we will be applying for research grants because there will be redundancy or there will be duplication or reinvention of the wheel if we simply propose a study that we are only because we are interested in it. Not just because we are interested in study uh, will, will already give us 
the right to do a study. No. The first thing that you have to uh, do is conduct a systematic literature review whether the topic that you have chosen has a research gap to be established. Or if there's no research gap in it, better tell your clients or maybe so, uh, your students to read, read the previous studies available because you're not anyway uh, creating any new knowledge or contributing to the body of knowledge, okay? So, so identification, okay, wait. Identification and prioritization of research gaps, if there are say, uh, three or four or five research gaps, what do you need to prioritize? Well, that is, uh, that we will also discuss that later. Um, it, because the identification and prioritization of research gaps will lead to more rapid generation of sub subsequent research. That's why even if we just publish a systematic, um, systematic literature review, that is in itself a very taxing and, and rigorous uh, task to do. Because doing, just doing the literature review is in itself a research paper, okay? So we can publish a research paper as long as we do it systematically. And how we do it systematically, we will discuss that. What is a systematic literature review? It's identifying critically evaluating and integrating the findings of all relevant high quality individual studies addressing one or more research questions. So it's not the Wikipedia, it's not just the blogs, but it's high quality individual studies that we will synthesize. So, so uh, we need to be wary about uh, what our students uh, use as literature. Mainly, when we say literature review, we refer to, to published peer-reviewed studies. Not just published, but peer-reviewed studies. Why? As what I mentioned earlier, the peer review will elevate the level of a paper because it will be evaluated by experts in the field. In the field. Yeah, so if I review, for example, uh, clinical studies, am I, am I an authority to do that? No, I'm not. So probably just some parts of the study I can review, but in terms of the content, no, I can't. Okay, that's the importance um, of uh, doing relevant literature review, which are, uh, okay, we, uh, the, where the literature that you have um, reviewed are relevant and high quality. Research in its, okay, systematic literature review is a research in its own right. It is able to address much broader questions than single empirical studies ever can. Uncovering connections among many empirical findings. So it can, it can uncover many empirical findings because you have to select the most, especially selecting the most recent ones. Uh, this is a very, very challenging job to do because um, you need to find research in your own field in which you are interested in, but uh, see to it that they are updated. The challenge if there are no updated articles, which means you also need to establish if there are no updated articles regarding the topic that you have chosen, then what does it mean by that? It means that there is a big possibility of a gap because it is not uh, well, well studied or it's not, uh, the studies are limited. Okay, now how to do, okay, wait. At the top of the hierarchy of evidence, this, okay, systematic literature review is at the top of the hierarchy of evidence. 
So our title is um, Establishing Research Gaps in Evidence-Based Studies. So this is the first evidence, okay? The literature, the product of your literature review is the uh, evidence that your study is really necessary and it is timely. And what did uh, Dr. Dinho, what were the three T's? The trend, trailblazing, what else? Trendy and timely, right? So we have to remember those three T's by Dr. Dinho, right? So uh, as what I pointed out before, it's only through doing or conducting a systematic literature review that you would be able to establish those three T's in publication or doing, even doing your thesis or dissertation or any research study, okay? Uh, why? Because it has, the uh, systematic literature review has the potential to provide the most important practical implications regarding your topic, okay? How to do systematic literature review? This is actually an issue because uh, many panel members just ignore the, this very part of the thesis or dissertation. Why? Of course, because um, it's very long, right, to read, and especially if it's not well organized and you don't know, and, and especially if the students or our advices did not write the literature review well. First of all, we are responsible for the outcomes of the students, why they write their literature review the way they did, right? So um, actually, uh, just writing the literature review is another topic for a whole day supposed to be. But uh, let me just brief you with these very important points in, write, in doing a systematic literature review. First, we have to establish to what extent existing research has progressed towards uh, clarifying a particular problem. So we need to see what's, uh, what are, the, what are uh, written about our topic. Second, identify relations, contradictions, gaps, and inconsistencies in the literature and explore reasons for this. I will show you the reasons for, for the research gaps later in a while. Yeah. For him, next, formulate general statements or an overarching conceptualization. Okay. We have to correct our students who simply copy and paste the literature review. Copy, then paste, and there's no synthesis, there's no critical analysis done. Yeah. Uh, the most important thing that every researcher should do is to make a point, make a point, rather than summarizing all the points everyone else has made. How, how are the points related to your study? If you are not able to do that, then you're not doing any critical analysis. And that is why uh, it's actually the skill we need to teach our students in the first place, because uh, why thesis is important. It has to improve the critical thinking analysis of our students. Without us teaching them how to do that, we fail to develop our very important uh, responsibility as educators. Okay? And we have to comment on, evaluate, extend, or develop theory. So uh, for example, in making a point, so uh, actually, in the literature review, we start our every paragraph with our own point. We don't have to say, according to, oh, I will be very bored if I keep on reading the same phrase, according to, according to. Yeah, and it starts right away with according to. What's your point? What's the point you are trying to, um, to argue? Okay, so your argument the first uh, paragraph in your literature review and even in your introduction should be your own argument. Uh, your own argument then supported by evidences. What are these evidences? Evidences from the literature review which you have summarized. Okay? So if we 
If we do that with our students, if we lead our students to do that, to start with a topic sentence, which means the topic sentence is the argument or the claim that we make supported by evidences, evidences, support, supporting details, who said so and what, okay? So it's not, it's not starting with the point of the author, otherwise we will not be heard. Our voice as the researcher will not be heard. We just try to copy and paste the points of other people, okay? And so we need to comment on, evaluate, extend, or develop theory. So we, uh, I'll be giving you an example to that in a while. In doing these things, provide implications for practice and policy, and describe directions for future research, okay? Um, there are only lately, because of uh, the, the ambiguity of the criteria of the research grants providers or the funders of many uh, big grants uh, internationally, they have um, created a framework in identifying research gaps, particularly in the field of clinical or allied health. So, uh, because a majority of our course offerings are in the allied health, but it can also be applicable to any other fields because uh, by following this framework, we can systematize or we will have a systematic uh, framework literature review and uh, in looking for uh, our research gaps and establishing, of course, the necessity of our study. Okay, first, identification and classification of the, the reasons why the research gaps exist. And the second is characterization of the research gap using the PCOS, uh, population, intervention, comparison, outcomes, setting and elements. And actually, as I went over uh, other frameworks, they included T, so now we have, we have the PCOS. PCOS. Uh, uh, let me first discuss how we identify reasons for research gap existence. There are four uh, elements that we need to look for uh, in identifying our research gap, uh, the research gap. First is the insufficient or imprecise information. What is it? Um, no studies are identified or limited number of studies are identified or if the sample size in the available studies, sizes are too small to allow conclusions about the question of interest. And we can ask the following questions. How many studies have been conducted that address the key question? So uh, somehow we, we will do meta-analysis in this, in this point. So Ma'am Jolly is teaching meta-analysis and it's, uh, it uh, includes statistics uh, for us to count or to verify how many studies have been published about that topic. So, uh, which means we need to really do an exhaustive, exhaustive um, uh, literature review in this regard. And how large are the studies? If there's only one study, how large it is, is the study? Um, but uh, if there's only one study, it's already a gap, and I will point that out later. Okay, another one is bias information, methodological limitations of studies, or appropriateness of the study design. For example, how it is expressed in the study. There is a need for randomized controlled trials with outcome as assessor blinding to compare the effects of various newer oral diabetes agents in women with gestational diabetes, okay? That's an example. Later on, I'm going to let you do uh, your own uh, identification of the research gaps uh, in the workshop that will follow. And another one is the inconsistency or unknown consistency. Consistency is defined as the degree to which reported effect sizes from included studies appear to go in the same direction. It should be kept in mind that as the statistically significant effect size in one study and an effect size whose confidence interval overlaps null in another study do not necessarily constitute inconsistent results. Okay? If there is only one available study, even if considered large sample size, 
the consistency of results is unknown. So you will see this expression. Uh, this, uh, there is no evidence or um, this field or this, uh, this topic is unknown in the literature, okay, like that. Not the right information. Results from studies might not be applicable to the population and or setting of interest. So you can justify that your study is necessary because the population of the previous studies is different from the population I'm targeting. Yeah, okay? Optimal or most important outcomes might not be assessed. So what outcomes, what potential outcomes do you want to assess in a study which were not covered in the previous studies? Okay. And the last, the study duration might be too short. Yeah, that's why uh, longitudinal studies are required, especially in clinical trials. Yeah. Might not be followed up for long enough duration to adequately assess some outcomes which might be most important. Okay. Now this is I'm going to present to you the framework that is used by um, the NIH uh, where we applied, and this is now very common among funders of grants, which, uh, are, which is the next direction of our university. We are actually trying to apply for more grants, and we have already identified one, which we will be including um, the, the allied health because it, it concerns them primarily. Okay, this is the Pickett's gap framework in evidence-based practice. Okay, so, so you may identify your research gaps uh, with these elements. There are five, one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, in the original framework, only PCOS. Now, uh, actually, originally, it's only PCO. And then it developed into PCOT. And then it became PCOTS. It it includes the setting and or study design in other frameworks, okay? So first of all, how is your population different? Your targeted, your targeted population Okay, so your targeted population, for example, is uh, only women and aged women. So uh, that will, if the literature shows that there were no aged women involved in the previous studies, then you are justified to do another study, okay? Using Okay, another one is the intervention. What intervention has been used in, or interventions have been identified in the previous literature? If the same interventions will be used, how different will your study be? For example, uh, in the, the same intervention but different population, then you are still justified to, to uh, proceed to your topic. And another one is comparison. Okay, where, there, where, where the previous studies uh, try, uh, controlled or were there control groups? So if there's no comparison, well, of course, if you include a comparison group, then your study is stronger. Then you have to, you have to um, rationalize that the previous studies were not controlled. So uh, justifying your, the need for your uh, proposed study, okay? And outcomes. Information regarding outcomes of interest organized by type of outcome to delineate where information is lacking. What uh, outcomes do you want to have, for example, for diabetic uh, patients? So uh, the previous studies uh, had different outcome goals. So you will be st stating your own uh, different outcome goal in your proposal. And 
And as what I said earlier, time is included in this new framework. So the information on appropriate time frame for intervention and or outcomes, because time has, is an important element also in conducting a study. Because if uh, a longitudinal study and a short time frame study uh, will be different in terms of the outcomes okay, and the, res uh, the results. Then the last element for the Picot's grape gap uh, identification framework is setting. The setting. Uh, if the setting, okay. Uh, I always ask, in the panel, I always ask uh, the question, how is America or the United States different from the Philippines? If you are saying that uh, studies have been conducted abroad, for example, in the United States or in the Western countries, how is their setting different from the setting in the Philippines? You need to justify that, okay? So that will be another, another uh, element in the identification of research gap. And uh, also the study design. If, for example, the study designs uh, in the previous literature were all quantitative, yeah, then um, you have to justify why a qualitative study design or a qualitative method is necessary for you to, to uh, also uh, propose. Yeah. So you need to justify every step of your way. Yeah. And so, because if we have to uh, remember them, it's easy, right? What are those? Population, patient or problem. Second is intervention. Third is the comparison. Fourth is outcomes. The third, uh, fifth is time. And the sixth is setting or study design. Okay, so we should remember that because we will be doing a workshop in a while. Now, what are the expressions to start the problem statement? Or where do we find? Where do we, first of all, where do we find the research gap? It is usually in the, in the introduction. And you will see some expressions such as to start the problem statement. Yeah, the problem statement, okay, in my practice, uh, back in Thailand and Malaysia, <laughs> where I worked for 10 years, uh, that's why when I arrived here, I had a culture shock uh, in terms of the problem statement because back there, uh, we uh, the problem statement is not the it's not the part of the study or a paper uh, that starts with uh, this. Uh, the problem of this study is like that. No, um, it in there, the problem statement is where the research gap is identified. So that is the problem statement. What's the problem and what is the research gap? So we will be uh, doing that and I'll be showing you an example to that. So what are the expressions to start the problem statement? What remains unknown is there is, po there is a paucity or, or what are the other terms for, for paucity? Paucity, scarcity, right? There's a scarcity or paucity uh, there are limited studies, right? Um, there is a positive literature examining, then this initial understanding fails to consider, previous studies failed to address, or what this theory does not explain is, and there is limited liter literature on. So these are the common um, expressions to identify the research gap. And what about, okay, uh, Establishing what is known in the literature, okay? Here are the phrases, it is known that, research has shown or researchers have demonstrated, debate exists about or, or contradictions exist about or there have been contradicting results on. Then, um, that, that is controversial because of that, 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 okay? And let me show you how this research gap is exemplified even in 
you know, even in abstract, the, um, I have to tell you that the most difficult part of the study I had to, to write was my abstract because uh, it's the only part of my dissertation that had to be evaluated by a panel of experts. And I had to revise it 20 times to include the problem of the study. Uh, the problem was the problem then the research gap has to be included as well and all the, the parts. So it, it does not only start with this study established like that. No, you have to establish first the, the problem. Okay. Let me show you an example. I have to show it. It's rather small. But can you read that? All right, the favorite topic of Dr. Taklan. Right. Heat pump technology has been used for heating, ventilation, and air conditioning in domestic and, wow, this is challenging. Thank you, thank you. Right. So it says here, in domestic and industrial sectors in most developed countries of the world, including South Africa. However, heat pump drying of fruits and vegetables has been largely ex unexploited in South Africa and by extension to the Sub-Saharan African region. That's the problem. It's not, it's not uh, studied. Although studies on heat pump drying started in South Africa several years ago, not much progress has been recorded to date. So that is, uh, it has to really be based on the literature review, okay? What about in terms of the, the introduction? We will see how, how we should be including the research gap in the introduction. And uh, this book provides a very systematic way of doing that. Uh, these are the four important elements in the introduction that uh, we should have to really check when we will be advising our students. First is the problem. Um, in IS, uh, when we presented there, everyone was asked about the uh, the problem. What's the problem? Why are you trying to uh, propose this topic? What's the problem? So uh, we will know, first of all, we should identify the problem. And after the problem, what is known about your problem in the literature? And of course, what is unknown? That is the gap. Okay. And uh, we will then, from there, we should be we should be identifying or um, indicating our purpose why we have to conduct the study. So, okay, so in a ladder, sorry, we will see this. So in a establishing the research gap, first, we describe the problem, the difficulty or the situation that interests you. Then, second, establish briefly what has already been said and done in this area. So what is known? Okay, so we start with the problem, then what is known, and then the third step is to point out was what has not been known or what has not been done, what is not yet known, and that is the research gap. And lastly, the fourth step in, uh, in your introduction is explain what you hope to do to add to the body of knowledge. So that will define your contribution to the body of knowledge. And uh, uh, if you have not established this, it's really very unlikely that you will be published, especially in high 
impact journals. Okay, for example, in Scopus and ISI journals, uh, which are very strict in terms of the review, the review process. Okay, and uh, where do we? Okay, uh, we will try to see an example on how a paper address these four four steps. So using the same. So consumers, in a bid to have healthier, it's too small, right? Yeah. So let's identify the problem. And then um, problem, what is known, what is unknown, and what is the purpose. And then later on, I'll give you your own materials to really uh, do uh, Find, uh, you have to find all these four elements in the introduction and the contribution, the identification of contribution to the body of knowledge, uh, which is usually highlighted in the conclusion. Okay, so let's try this one. Consumers in a bid to have healthier and more natural foodstuffs have been encouraged to increase their daily intake of fruits and vegetables because their nutritional values as suppliers of vitamins, minerals, fiber, and low fat are well recognized. However, the water content of most fruits and vegetables is higher than 80%, which limits their shelf life and makes them more susceptible to storage and transport problems. Vegetables and fruits can be made more acceptable to consumers by drying. Okay, so that's the context and the problem, right? So let's try to find the, okay, actually the problem continues in there, but we have to move on because we're running out of time. Now, let's try to find out in here, in the introduction, the uh, second part, which is what is known in the literature. Okay, what is known in the literature? And then later on, what is unknown? According to Bonazzi and Dumoulin, drying is needed to extend the shelf life of foods without the net need for refrigeration storage to reduce weight and bulk volumes for saving in the cost of transportation and storage to convert perishable products to st stable forms. Okay, so um, all right, so okay, so that's the known. However, heat heat pump drying of fruits and vegetables has been largely unexploited in South Africa and by extension to the Sub-Saharan African region. That is the problem. And then, although studies in heat pump drying started in South Africa several years ago, not much progress has been recorded uh, to date in Sub-Saharan Africa. Many potential users view heat pump drying technology as fragile, slow, and high capital intensive when compared with the conventional dryer. However, heat pump drying has been found to be more effective in drying of material with higher amount of free moisture such as tomato. And of course, citation, citations. So we need the citations to have the evidence, of, of course, um, because uh, we are saying we need to establish the evidence that we, uh, there is a necessity or a need to conduct your study, okay? And in here, the, pa the paper attempts to bring together the basic information on the effects of heat pump drying, which are inconveniently scattered in several journals and texts in order to justify the need to carry out cutting-edge research on heat pump drying in sub-Saharan Africa. So what is that? That is now the purpose of the study. So, oh, so in this paper, it is clear that uh, it has established the four basic elements of the introduction for you to be justified to conduct the study. Another here, actually it's not, it's not only one uh, research gap that was identified. And in here it's about the limited studies, yeah. The limited studies that uh, have, uh, have been pointed out. Thing. Okay, 
So actually, you will be having more very good examples uh, in the papers that I will be giving you because uh, I'll be giving you by field, uh, by your own discipline. So um, you will be finding all those elements. And then if there's no element, of course, uh, you have to comment or critique about it. Then uh, let's find out how this paper identified the contribution of the study. Uh, generally, we find uh, the, the highlight of the contribution of the study in the conclusion. Okay. Actually, uh, there are two important parts that we need to mind in our conclusion. Conclusion is not just a rehash uh, it's not just the place to rehash the summary or the, the results of your study because you already presented all of uh, the results of the study. Simply highlight your main contribution to the body of knowledge. If you, uh, if you are writing your conclusion, if you fail to establish the research gap, how will you be able to highlight your contribution in your conclusion? if you were not able to establish your, the research gap in the first place. So that's why uh, the conclusion and the introduction go together. They should be congruent. So uh, whatever you highlighted as the research gap in the introduction should also be highlighted in the conclusion. They should uh, go together. Uh, should highlight contributions to the body of knowledge and this is one thing that um, many researchers uh, fail to do. Um, we should provide directions for future research. And where do we place that? In every research journal article, we should include this direction for future research in the recommendation. Actually, um, w this is the very important part that is uh, always asked by reviewers and of course by the my supervisors before and the panelists i should really include the direction for future research and if we do this if all researchers do this identifying the research gap will be made easier why you just go to conclusions you just go to the introduction and then read the conclusion and if that research study has been done completely, uh, even highlighting the, the major contributions and the direction for future research, wow, it will be so easy to do research. Yeah. So, so it, it will be easier for us to do uh, the establishing of the research gap. So maybe in the next research that you will be writing, you, will, you really have to do that. It's not only important that we need to do this in the graduate school. Why? The problem that I see is that uh, students doing their master's degree who were not uh, taught uh, identifying the research gap ha have a hard time doing it because relearning and learning is not easy. So that's why it's not only in the graduate school that we have to develop this practice. It has also to, it has to start with our undergraduate, even just one research gap that they are able to identify. As long as they know how to do the process, then we will be happy. We will be, uh, we will be uh, letting our students identify the research gap from the very start. So once we will be, <clears throat> we will be asking them by level, of course, uh, if it's a PhD level, then more gaps need to be identified. For the undergraduate, maybe one or two, or just one will be okay. But for masters, <clears throat> should be more. And for PhD, well, we will be critiquing models, <clears throat> models and uh, theories, which are hard, right? <clears throat> So 
So, the next time we write our conclusion, we have to include this. <clears throat> we have to highlight our contributions. And how do we provide direction? Let's see how. Let's uh, get a sample from another field. Okay, so the conclusions, how it is written in here. Our results might have a significant impact on improving the design of shortcut menus of diagnostic and laboratory test ordering systems, either in the Portuguese National Health Service or in other countries health system. So it's also the, the application to other settings. Okay? These improvements can help reduce the prescription of unnecessary tests. Yeah, of course, yes. Leading to the reduction of negative patient effects and to the reduction of unnecessary costs. These study results demonstrate the importance of testing and evaluating various aspects of medical informatics programs to improve efficiency and contribute to improve clinical practice and clinical outcomes. So th this is for the medtech. Yeah. So you see the the contribution is highlighted, but is there a direction for future research? Is there a direction for future research in the conclusion? Yeah. So it might be incomplete, but it has highlighted its contribution to the body of knowledge. You will find later in this very good examples that I have chosen for you, uh, examples of all of those elements. Yeah, so you will try to find them because I have, uh, I prepared uh, for different disciplines. So you will know how it is done in, in, in your own discipline. So, so that when the next time that you will really wish to publish, you really have to mind the gap because it's the very first um, area that, uh, of the research or the very first element of research that needs to be considered. Yeah. For our workshop, any question? Any question so far? Okay, so let's, let's do it. Let's group, let's try to find out from those articles in your own field, uh, the four elements. The four, okay. I will be giving you different kinds of studies. So some will get original research. What's that original research? Because there are, there are six kinds of um, research articles that are generally published. One is original research, which, ha which uh, is uh, primary research, uh, where the researchers have done the study themselves in terms of the trials and uh, the interventions. And review article, is, it's a systematic review, uh, which is uh, considered as a research by itself. Yeah. And clinical case study or trial study, yeah. A clinical trial and opinion paper or a book review so these are generally published but depending on the uh, the journal that you will be submitting your paper but uh, uh, what we do in here is mostly what we what do we normally do with our students of course uh, we do original research but I encourage you to write some uh, review journal, uh, review me. You have done a review, right? So you can publish review because it's not easy to do. And that leads out to, um, to further studies. And you are actually making the life of other researchers uh, easy. It's easier for them. If 
because if we will be able to find some very uh, systematic literature review that already identifies the research gap. And then where do we find the research gaps aside from literature review, uh, aside from systematic uh, reviews? Where else? In the conclusion. But as I have presented to you, conclusion, the conclusion that I have shown you did not or does not contain the, the direction for future research. But I will ask you later if you can find them in your own, uh, pa uh, the paper that I will be giving you. Okay, so uh, what you have to do in here, I'll be giving you 15 minutes to find these elements in the introduction. What are those four elements to review? The problem, the what is known, what is not known, and the purpose. Right, very good. And what framework will you, do you like to follow? What framework of establishing the gap, the gap would you like to follow? Picots, pico or picots, or probably you will just identify one or two of them, right? So it's not, it's not ex uh, you don't have to use or to find all of them because uh, definitely you will not see all of these uh, elements in just one study. You may find them in different studies. So now you have a clear way of assessing how an introduction is written. So when you will be presented a title, first of all, what will you ask for? If you sit down in a panel, what will you ask? The biggest question. Actually, the biggest question in research is, is there a gap? Yeah. And at the end, in the final, in the final presentation or final defense, you will ask, what's your contribution? These are the biggest questions in research that are asked. Okay? So let's try doing now. Let's have uh, the workshop. Oh, please group yourselves according to your discipline by three. I hope we have enough. Uh, I guess we have enough. Three or four according to your discipline. For example, languages, uh, uh, history, uh, this, uh, theology, yeah, psychology. I have everything for you. Yeah, um, we have business. For business, we have 